We're going to get into Daniel 6. Yay! And I actually took the 28 page handout that I had and broke it into three. And uh, so, so you have a bunch of more. We're going to do that handout today. But first, we're going to read the chapter Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm, so the governors and satraps sought how to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel, a minion of my kingdom. Men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Praise the Lord. So... We're going to look the first hand. I'll tell you what, the next two lessons are going to be kind of interesting. Like, like what's going to happen is we're going to look at how do you deal, how do you handle when a government makes unjust laws? This chapter goes there. That will be next week. The week after that, we're going to look at Daniel's parallel. <coughs> so I really think. This is going to be really good. I also want to tell you that in October and in November, I've been given the opportunity to do on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock a school of prayer. So I'm going to teach on prayer for every Sunday morning for October and November. Uh, it'll be in two different rooms. It's all one class. I understand. I don't know if they fix this or not. It might be, it might be confusing. But it's eight weeks. It's not four weeks in 2B and four weeks in here. They couldn't put us all. They couldn't give us this room the whole time. So there'll be four weeks in that room and four weeks in this room, unless something changes. But I'm going to teach on the school of prayer. And I hope everybody comes, because prayer matters. I hope everybody stays for the 6 o'clock room. Prayer matters. But tonight, Daniel 6, 1, 2, 3. It says it pleased Darius in verse 1. So I'm going to go through some of this kind of quickly, but you know I like to give I like to give more than we need in the handout, and then we're going to settle into the stuff that I think you're going to find interesting about wisdom. But but Darius, there is no record of Darius outside this biblical story. And consequently, many liberals have concluded that the book of Daniel is just historically wrong. Um, D.J. Wiseman studied the course of history, but he based all of his all of his studies on something called the Nabonidus Chronicle. We looked at that, and in fact, we'll look at it again in just a brief moment. We looked at it in here when we did Daniel chapter five. According to Wiseman's study, and he is conservative, there was no room for Darius the Mede to have ever reigned over Babylon. When we studied Daniel five, we saw that for many years historians denied that either Belshazzar or Pilate ever actually existed. And then they found archaeological evidence for them, but it didn't exist for like a couple thousand years. So it is very possible, first of all, that Wiseman failed to recognize that there actually could be an error in the Nabonidus Chronicle, because he based everything on that. Why does it have to be the Bible that's wrong? Why can't it be the Nabonidus Chronicle? Um, it is also possible that, frankly, there's just historical confusion over the identity of Darius. Who is he? Um, again, Wiseman bases everything on the idea that the Nabonidus Chronicle is correct. So, regarding number one, does the Nabonidus Chronicle have its details mixed up? Why assume that the book of Daniel has the details messed up? 
When we studied Daniel 5, we saw that the Nabonidus Chronicle portrays Nabonidus rather than Nebuchadnezzar as having had that seven-year affliction where he goes insane and acts like an animal. Nabonidus Chronicle said that's Nabonidus. The book of Daniel says it is Nebuchadnezzar. The prayer of Nabonidus in the Nabonidus Chronicle is very similar to the prayer of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. It's on page 2. We looked at it, but I'll still do it real quick here. Um, the, and this is, this is um, it says, words of the prayer said by Nabonidus, king of Babylonia, and anything that's in the brackets means the words missing from the ancient document. You don't have that problem with the Bible. You know, you've got thousands of ancient Bible manuscripts. You've got like, what, I don't know, the number five documents of Plato. Like one of the most significant things ever. You've got thousands of the Bible and you have five Plato. You know, so why assume that the other documents are right? You see the point? Um, so the word, the great is missing. Uh, so they're assuming that it's in there based on what they do see. So words of the prayer said by Nabonidus, king of Babylonia, the great king, when afflicted with an ulcer on command of the most high God in Tamar. So the, the disease is, in this case, an ulcer. I, Nabonidus, was afflicted with an evil ulcer. Okay, that sounds like Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4 saying, I was afflicted. Um, for seven years. Well, that's how long Nebuchadnezzar's affliction was. You can see how this looks the same. I, for seven years, and far from men, I was driven. Well, the, it says twice in Daniel 4 that Nebuchadnezzar was driven. I was driven until I prayed to the Most High God. And an exorcist pardoned my sins. He was a Jew from among the children of the exile of Judah. Well, that would fit Daniel. Daniel was a Jew. He calls him an exorcist. Recount this in writing to glorify and exalt the name of the Most High God. Then I wrote this when I was afflicted for seven years. That's, the, again, the length of time that it happened to Nebuchadnezzar. By the Most High God, with an evil ulcer during my stay at Tamar. I prayed to the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood, stone, and lime. And then they add here, it is interesting to note that the line have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron is right out of what Belshazzar does in Daniel chapter 5, verse 4, when he orders that the goblets be used to praise the gods of gold, silver, bronze. So it's like, it's, it's right after the prayer of Nabonidus in Daniel chapter 5. So the Bible has Ned Belshazzar making that statement, and the Bible has the prayer actually being done by Nebuchadnezzar, but the Chronicle of Nabonidus has all of this attached to Nabonidus, who is what? He is the son, historically, the son of Nebuchadnezzar and the father of Belshazzar. So you can just see how it just, you know, you can just see how this could all come together. So, um, rather than denying the existence of Darius, Darius, might there be some confusion now over the identity of Darius? Okay, so we're going to not go through most of this, but I'm going to just give you some, kind of lead you along. And the reason I like to do this is, What's going to happen? The notes give you, and you already probably noticed, they give shelf life to everything you learn. Because three, five years from now, if you're in a situation and you want to know what, if, you can open this up, and you may, we may not have covered everything, but you're going to be able to look at this, and we've covered it enough, and you're going to know this book. You see the book because you, oh, I remember this. Oh, that's more. That's the point. I want you to really learn the Bible. Here. Okay, so the, who is Darius the Mede? The Bible Knowledge Commentary suggests four possible answers for who he actually is. First, critics have long questioned the historicity of Daniel. They challenge Daniel's reference to the accession of Darius to the throne because there's no historical evidence outside the Bible for his reign. So here's four possible answers according to the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Number one, <coughs> Darius might just be another name for Cyrus. That's a, that's a good possibility, just another name. Number two, the second explanation is that Darius was appointed by Cyrus to rule over Babylon. And yeah, that's essentially the same as what's going to be number five. Okay. Number th three is 
is Darius the same person as Cyrus? And um, this option was considered near the end of the lesson in Daniel chapter 5. Um, and this view, held by that same scholar, Wiseman, who is conservative, um, says it has simplicity in its favor. It claims that Darius the Mede is just another name of Cyrus the Persian, just another name. And it's based upon a translation of Daniel 6.28, which the Aramaic, now Daniel 6 is written in Aramaic, but, but the, so the Aramaic supports this, but the Hebrew and uh, Masoretic text is different and it doesn't support it. Okay? But it was written in Aramaic. So that's a pretty good statement right there. And it permits it to be read like this. Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, even the reign of Cyrus the Persian, meaning the same person. Still others, number four, suggest Darius the Mede should be identified with Cambyses, Cyrus's son. That's a possibility. And then um, number five, some authorities say that Darius was a vassal under Cyrus's sovereignty. He served under that. If you, how many of you have seen the Sight and Sound movie on Daniel? Anybody seen that? The few is, okay, it's really good. Um, that's exactly what they that they do. And the the source that I provided for that is Sancina, but there are some who do that. Sancina is a good source. And then number six, I said one of them was essentially the same as number five. I should have said essentially um, uh, number six. This Darius is identified by the sages as Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, who is Xerxes, same person, different name, um, from the book of Esther. And so it could be the same person. And so we're going to go over and have it. Those are just some possible answers. And if you go over to page five, oh, actually page four. The Anchor Yale Bible plainly says that Darius cannot be identified. They don't say he doesn't exist. They say we don't know who he is. It's a good source. It's a, it's a good like scholarly book. We just don't know who this guy is. We can't say. Go over to page five now. Darius. This is what we. This is what we can say. He is an unremarkable person. <laughs> Why? Because outside the book of Daniel, he leaves no significant mark on history. He doesn't do anything. So there's no surprise when you consider how easily he is duped by his advisors in Daniel 6. <coughs> they convince him to throw his friend in the lion's den, and he's upset about it and spends the whole night awake fasting. Hey, are you okay? He doesn't want to do this. He's duped by his advisors. He leads an unremarkable life. No wonder history doesn't mention him. <laughs> See the point? That's kind of interesting. Daniel 6, 1 to 2. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to him so that the king would suffer no loss. The new government now needs to organize. They needed trustworthy people who were familiar with the land and who could gather the taxes. So there are benefits to using some of the qualified men from the previous cabinet. Since Daniel is in exile and he's not Babylonian, he's less likely to be a threat to Darius's new kingdom than anybody who's actually Babylonian. So that makes good sense. So when Belshazzar is slain in Daniel 5.30, Daniel gets promoted. If Darius has heard that Daniel actually derided Belshazzar that very night and predicted the fall of Babylon the night before, well, it's very likely then that Daniel would actually get promoted by Darius. So it just actually makes sense. There's 120 satraps. It's just a word for governor of a Persian province. There's three governors who are like chief overseers. Why are there 120 mentioned? Probably, likely, each one's ruling over a province. In other words, they're ruling over part of the government. It's possible that the 120 is just a rounded figure. Interestingly enough, according to Esther 1.1, the Persian Empire has 127 provinces. So it's almost exactly the same. 
Although the Jewish study Bible does suggest the possibility that Esther's mention of 127 could be an exaggeration. It is also possible that the number of provinces could fluctuate just a little bit. It's possible that, you know, there's all constant little reorganizations of the provinces that could happen. So 120, 127. Um, perhaps a few of the satraps rule over more than one province. The Medo-Persian Empire may have grown uh, from Darius's original 120 to Xerxes 127. All that's possible. No doubt, at the bottom of page five, the king is going to want a chain of command. It's going to be easier for the king to check on three chief administrators than to check on 120. And who better than Daniel, a senior man with lots of experience, with no reason to be loyal to the kingdom that he just prophesied against. On page six. Essentially, what Darius does is the same thing that Moses does um, when Jethro versus his father-in-law says, hey, you can't do this. You can't rule over all these people like this. You need to set up a hierarchy. You need some rulers of thousands. You need some rulers of hundreds. You need some rulers of fifties. And you judge the big stuff and you train them on how to judge the little stuff. So it's, it's, it's just a normal way of doing history. Okay, it says, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the other governors and safe jobs because he has an excellent spirit. That's what the new King James Version is. He has an excellent spirit. The old King James says, then this Daniel was preferred because he had an excellent spirit. I like the way the message puts this. You don't hear me say that very often, <laughs> but I do. But Daniel, brimming with spirit and intelligence, so completely outclassed the other vice regents and governors that the king decided to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. So he has this excellent spirit. Word commentary, which is a really good conservative commentary. It's, uh, if you put them all, like the volumes, like they have more than one volume for different books of the Bible, sometimes it's only one. Imagine this. No. And imagine two of these. Because that's word biblical commentary. Okay? And it's conservative. So it's, it's a good commentary system <coughs> and every book's written by every Bible book written by a different person and it translates he has a remarkable spirit so Daniel has a remarkable spirit let's talk about this in Daniel 1 8 he shows how remarkable his spirit is when he purposes to not defile himself with the king's food he shows in Daniel 2 27 to 45 how remarkable his spirit is when he tells Nebuchadnezzar what the dream is and what it means. In Daniel 2, 24, he shows how remarkable the spirit is when he pleads for the wise guy's life who wanted to kill him. He says in Daniel 2, 24, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. He doesn't say do not destroy me. He says don't destroy them. They wanted to kill me. And he says don't destroy. He's got a remarkable spirit. Remembering Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. Daniel's placed under Ashpenaz's rule. He's the master of the eunuchs. Evidently, it's very likely, and the sight and sound movie on Daniel makes the point. It's very likely that Daniel has been castrated by Ashpenaz's um, team, and yet he pleads for their lives. He pleads for them. Hey, don't kill the chief for the castrators. He's got a remarkable spirit. In Daniel chapter 4, he shows his remarkable spirit when he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the tree being cut down. In Daniel chapter 5, he shows his remarkable spirit when he stood up for God and points his sober prophetic finger in the face of a drunken king. Belshazzar. He has a powerful personality. In Daniel 6, we're going to see in a couple of weeks that his spirit is remarkable in his prayer life. Throughout the book, Daniel is consistently showing that he has a remarkable spirit by the way that he maintains himself under pressure. He is a Hebrew in exile, yet he excels above all the other lifelong wise gods. When threatened with death, 
He interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. And now in chapter 6, he will maintain his cool even inside the lion's den. It is fair to say that Daniel's personality exudes charisma. So it doesn't take long for Darius to recognize how remarkable Daniel was and to put him over all the other wise guys. Now Daniel's remarkable persona is marked by this wisdom. Daniel 1, uh, Psalm 1, 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a spiritual trait. It is the foundation of true wisdom. There is also a demonic wisdom. The difference is, we're going to see this, demonic wisdom is selfish wisdom. James chapter 3. If you have bitter envy and seek self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, which is wisdom, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Sensual. I'm thinking of Solomon. He was the wisest man who ever lived, but his wisdom was not like Daniel's. And the kingdom gets split under his son Rehoboam. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The other wise men have earthly, sensual, demonic wisdom. They are conniving schemers using their abilities and status for selfish gain. So let's look at his wisdom, hey Dave. Look how often his wisdom is mentioned. First of all, he's chosen for apparent wisdom. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Then the king instructed Asphenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking gifted in all wisdom. So he's chosen right from the beginning. Something is apparently there about him being wise. God gifted Daniel with increasing wisdom. Daniel 1.17 As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. Daniel is found to possess wisdom when examined. Daniel 1.20 And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians. So he shows wisdom when examined. He answers with wisdom. In Daniel 2.14 Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariel. We looked at that. When he receives the divine impartation about Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel recognizes where the wisdom comes from. He's alone in the prayer room at this point. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in darkness. <laughs> And light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You've given me wisdom and might. And now you've made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. And then when he delivers the divine impartation, Daniel recognizes the reason that he is given this wisdom. And he recognizes it is not given for my good, my own benefit. It is for the benefit of others. New King James, he tells the king in Daniel 2.30, But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me, because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, now notice the word our is in italics. When a Bible puts a word in italics, it is the translator's way of telling you the word is not in the original language. The New King James added the word. 
Okay. But for our sakes, who may know the interpretation to the king, that you, O king, may know the thoughts of your heart. The TLV has it correct. But as for me, this mystery is not revealed to me because I possess more wisdom than any other living person. But in order that the king may know the interpretation. On the next page, the same verse, Daniel 2.30 in the NIV, confirms what the TLV <laughs> translates. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, may know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. This is not given to me for my good. This is given to me for your good. Daniel has a lasting reputation for wisdom. Perhaps this is because he's not selfish. He's using it for the benefit of others. Daniel 5.11, the queen mother says to Belshazzar on his last night, There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God, and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, is found in him. And then she says that to Belshazzar, and then Belshazzar says to Daniel in 5.14, I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. So Daniel has a lasting reputation for wisdom. Now wisdom is really, really important. Proverbs 4, verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. NIV, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. The TLV, wisdom is supreme, acquire wisdom. The message, above all and before all, do this, get wisdom. The word principle or supreme, whatever this word is, beginning, above all, it can, uh, Rashid, it actually can mean first, the beginning, or best, the chief, or choice part. The theological word book of the Old Testament, which is the best general lexicon out there that's like there are others that are much more, but this is like this is the one that they trained us to use at the seminary. Literally, no matter what else we used when I was at in seminary in in, in, in the Assemblies of God seminary, no matter what else we would use, the, the old test the head of the Old Testament theology department would actually say to us, Yeah, but what does the TWOT say? And if you didn't use anything else, he was fine. If you didn't mention that, he's always going to ask you, what did that book say? It's actually too far. So that theological workbook in the Old Testament says the primary meaning is the first or the beginning of a series. Of a series. In other words, this is where you start. Okay? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Going over to the next page. Note that all Hebrew words are based on a root word. The root is a three-letter word. All the Hebrew let words are based on three letters. Recognizing that, the TWOT says this of the root word that is the foundation for this Hebrew word, principle, beginning, or supreme. It says the primary meaning of the root is the head. So the foundation or the first in the list of what is important is wisdom. And the head is wisdom. This is where it starts. This is where it's going. I had to put this in there, but today when I was thinking about this, um, you know how the, the New Testament says, as your father is perfect, be ye perfect as your father in heaven. The, the Greek word for perfect is teleos. T-E-L-I-O-S. Which is essentially um, the basis of our English word telescope. And so like the telescope, you, it telescopes out. And when the Lord's telling us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, what he's really saying is to live for the end. I love to quote Ecclesiastes 7, the end of a thing is better than the beginning. That's really what it means to be perfect. It means to live for the end. That's wisdom. Okay, and so wisdom says it's the first in the list and it's the, end, the head of the list. It's where everything's going. Wisdom is mentioned 
first in the gifts of the uh, in the list of the gifts of the Spirit. First Corinthians twelve. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are differences of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom. It is listed first. Exactly what Proverbs and Psalms say would happen. It is not as, if you will, sexy as the rest of all the other gifts. None of them get first place. None of them. Okay. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. Thank you. To another gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another different kinds of tongues. To another interpretations of tongues. But one of the same Spirit works all these things. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. We love to think about all these other gifts. God says none of them deserve the place of first place. None of them. Wisdom gets first place. Knowledge gets second place. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is what do I do with what I know. I think we're going to have to give account on Judgment Day for my money. Well, I am. I'm going to have to give account on Judgment Day for how I treated my wife and kids. I am. I'm going to have to give account on Judgment Day. You name it. If I'm going to have to give account for those things, doesn't it make sense that I'm going to have to give account for the way I stewarded my mind? I do not think that most spiritual people really get a hold of this. The way you treat your mind is far more important than the way you treat your stuff or anything else. How you treat people, the decisions you make, wisdom. Now Daniel prayed for wisdom and praised God for giving it to him in Daniel 2. Because that wisdom empowered him to tell Nebuchadnezzar about his dream. He knew it was not being given to him for him. He knew it was being given to him for the king. That's why he asked for it. Perhaps we should pray for wisdom. And more often than we do, Solomon prayed for wisdom. He got it. He had some character flaws, but he got it. Perhaps we should pray for wisdom more often than we do. And would we have more wisdom if, number one, we prayed for it more often, and number two, that we understood that it was intended to be used for other people's benefit and not selfishly for ours? James 4, verse 2, you lust, and do not have. Lust, that's selfishness. That's for me. I want more wisdom. I want discerning of spirits. I want prophecy. See, I want. That's lust. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet. I see they have it. I want it. Well, it does say in 1 Corinthians 14 to covet the gifts. It does. So that's a good thing, especially that you might prophesy. It actually says that. Because you're built up other people. But why? You covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You do not pray. Daniel prayed for wisdom and he prayed for it for the benefit of others. So here is something that I prayed for decades. I got saved in 82 and um, one of the first things I got really into Kenneth Hagin Y'all know what he is? Yeah. I loved Ken Hagen for like 10 years. And he would teach people how to pray, um, and especially looking for verses that say things like, in him, in Christ, in whom. You all remember that? Anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was great. And he highlighted this passage here. And I prayed this passage probably as 
May no New Testament passage have I prayed more than this. I'll say it that way. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. God, would you give them the spirit of wisdom. And revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance of the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised them from the dead and seated them at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, the hierarchy of Satan's army. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, earlier, we saw that James chapter 3 calls self-seeking wisdom earthy, sensual, devilish. So when we pray for wisdom, let's pray for it for others. In Daniel 2.30, Daniel sought wisdom for King Nebuchadnezzar's welfare. I think there's a lesson here for all of us. Let me show you, I wrote it out I, I, just because, so I'd have, you could have it. But this is literally, I've prayed this, I, I probably started to pray it this way, but I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. But here's how I pray Ephesians 1. Lord, I pray that you would give unto me a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that I and others through me would know you better. Would you make me a person who enlightens the eyes of many people so that we would know the hope to which you have called us? Not me, us. Lord, would you use me to open people's eyes to the riches of your glorious inheritance as your saints? Would you use me to help your people to know the exceeding greatness of your power as a believer and a worshiper of Jesus? Lord, would you use me to help people know the power of your resurrection in many people's lives? Would you use me to help others see that you have called us to live above all the influence of the enemy's principalities and powers and might and dominion, both in this world and in the world to come. Daniel prayed for wisdom, not for his own good, but for the welfare of others. And what he saw, he did. Let's pray for wisdom.